Committee will come to order. Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing on Defense Department contracting in Afghanistan. Are we doing enough to com combat uh, corruption? Thank you all for being here. Apologies on delays. I, I, you're all uh, very busy with uh, very important responsibilities, and uh, I appreciate your patience as we uh, add votes on the floor uh, earlier. I'd like to welcome uh, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee, and members of the audience for being here. Today's proceedings continue this subcommittee's efforts to oversee the billions spent in support of military and civilian operations in Afghanistan. Last year, this subcommittee conducted an investigation of the Defense Department's host nation trucking contract. The purpose of this contract was to supply our military through the use of private contractors. The idea was to remove this burden from our armed forces while at the same time promoting the local Afghan economy. Almost since its inception in 2009, allegations surfaced that warlords, power brokers, and the Taliban were, would seek, quote, protection payments, end quote, for safe passage through tribal areas. According to those familiar with the contract, the result was a potential windfall for, for our enemy. In short, the American taxpayer had alleged, allegedly funded the same enemy our soldiers fought on the battlefield. While the investigation did not yield smoking gun evidence that this had occurred, the anecdotal evidence was substantial. At the same time, the investigation revealed that the Defense Department's contract oversight was woefully inadequate. This, despite whether the allegations could be substantiated, the oversight structure did not allow for swift and thorough review. These findings were released at a hearing last June at which the Pentagon leaders testified. As a result of that hearing and the subcommittee's investigative report, the Defense Department established three task forces to examine these particular issues as well as cor corruption in general. Today we will hear from the Defense Department about its findings and progress since last year's hearing, with the Commission on Wartime Contracting's recent revelation that anywhere between 30 and 60 billion dollars has been misappropriated in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. It is certainly critically important that the Pentagon get this right. I hope it has made significant progress in this regard. I also want to commend uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Tierney, for his uh, great and tireless work here. He's done some uh, uh, good research and in, in, uh, in diving deep into this, um, and uh, glad that uh, we can continue on with uh, the work that, uh, that he initiated. So I'd now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Thank you. I assume you can hear me, but I'll, I'll put that on at any regard. We have just marked the 10th anniversary of September 11th, and it is soon going to be a decade since our forces crossed the border into Afghanistan. We entered that conflict for a cause, and our brave men and women in uniform have largely accomplished the mission of ridding Afghanistan of al-Qaeda and the international terrorists that were threatening uh, the United States. I wanted to begin today by honoring uh, and stating once again how proud I am of all of those people that have given service to this country, and I also want to thank all of you your service to the country and to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines whom you supported. I ask Chairman Chaffetz to call this hearing to examine the problem of contracting corruption in Afghanistan. I thank him for doing so and for working with us on this issue. Last year, I led a six-month subcommittee investigation of the major Department of Defense logistics trucking contract in Afghanistan. Our investigation found that the trucking contract had spawned a vast protection racket in which warlords, criminals, and insurgents extorted contractors for protection payments to obtain safe passage. Our investigation further showed that senior officials within the United States military contracting chain of command had been aware of the problem, but had done little to address it. In plain English, the investigation found that the Department of Defense's supply chain in Afghanistan relied on paying the enemy and fueling corruption in order to maintain our substantial military footprint. Following the subcommittee's investigation, General Petraeus established three task forces designed to address the problem of contract corruption, and he issued new contracting guidelines to break down the silos between contracting and operations. These were important first steps. Since then, the Department has provided multiple briefings to the subcommittee staff demonstrating substantial progress in identifying where the U.S. taxpayer dollars are going. I commend the Department for that ongoing effort. Unfortunately, the picture presented is not pretty. Recent news reports stated that the Task Force 2010 has specifically identified and traced over $360 million in contracting dollars in Afghanistan that had been diverted to warlords, power brokers, insurgents, and criminal patronage networks. The task force also confirmed the results of the subcommittee's investigation, finding that many of the trucking contractors were, in fact, making illicit payments that ended up in the hands of the enemy. The Commission on Wartime Contracting looked at contingency contracting in both Iraq and Afghanistan and estimated that upwards of $60 billion in U.S. contracting dollars have been lost to waste, fraud, and abuse. 
I fear that these reports are only the tip of the iceberg. Much of the Afghan economy now centers around the United States and international military presence and logistics contracts, but a significant portion of those funds seem to end up supporting the Dubai real estate market rather than jobs in Afghanistan. At the top of the hierarchy, there are weekly reports about politicians or brothers and cousins of politicians who have obtained multi-million dollar contracts with the United States government. At the bottom of the hierarchy, the extortion of international contractors is a booming industry. Today, the business of Afghanistan is war. How can we ever hope to extricate ourselves from the war when so many Afghans benefit from the insecurity that is used to justify our continued presence? To my mind, we have crossed a tipping point in which the size of our military footprint inadvertently fosters further instability. Every additional soldier and every additional supply convoy that we send to Afghanistan further fuels this cycle of dependence, corruption, and endless war. With that said, I want to focus today on the hearing on three basic questions. One, what is the scope of contracting corruption in Afghanistan? Two, what is being done to address it? And three, how can we dramatically reduce it? Although I am skeptical about the design of the current United States endeavor there, for today's hearing we will focus on practical solutions that hopefully can be implemented right away. Congress has also had an important role to play. This spring I worked with the Armed Services Committee to include an amendment in the National Defense Authorization Act that would give commanders in the field more authority to immediately stop contracting with companies that undermine the efforts of our troops on the ground. I recently introduced a bill to establish a permanent inspector general for overseas contingency operations, one of the key recommendations of the Commission on Wartime Contracting. I encourage my colleagues here today to join me in that legislation, and I am also working to draft comprehensive contingency contracting reform legislation to fundamentally change the way we do business in war zones. I want to close by reading from General Petraeus' counterinsurgency contracting guidance released in September of 2010. He wrote, and I quote, If we spend large quantities of international contracting funds quickly and with insufficient oversight, it is likely that some of those funds will unintentionally fuel corruption, finance insurgent organizations, strengthen criminal patronage networks, and undermine our efforts in Afghanistan. Simply stated, we can't afford to fail at getting a handle on contracting corruption in Afghanistan. It is utterly unacceptable for any taxpayer dollars to ever make their way into the hands of those who would use them as a means to harm our brave men and women in uniform. So I appreciate your testimony here today, gentlemen. I look forward to our discussion. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Does any other member have an opening statement? Mr. Lynch is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing. And I, I want to associate myself with the remarks of our ranking member, Mr. Tanney, who has done yeoman's work, uh, along with the Chairman, uh, on, this, uh, on this issue and, and his staff. I have had the benefit of uh, traveling uh, many times to Afghanistan, uh, several times in the company of uh, Mr. Tanney's staff, and uh, on this issue. And I, I just uh, I just want to emphasize or, or amplify some of what Mr. Tierney has said here. Uh, we have a lawless environment in Afghanistan. And while I understand the, 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 the mission there and I understand the President's approach, there is still, I, I think, uh, a wide distance between where we should be in terms of watching our money and resources in that country and, and where it is today. I, I, I honestly believe, having, I don't know, maybe eight or nine trips over to Afghanistan uh, and, and many times uh, on this issue and on corruption in general, along with Kabul Bank, which is a whole other issue, uh, I honestly believe at this point that, that corruption Corruption is a greater enemy and a greater threat to Afghanistan uh, stability than the Taliban. I think the Taliban uh, can be beaten or, or, or co-opted. I think corruption in that culture, in that country, uh, is, is a much uh, tougher road. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I applaud uh, Mr. Tierney on his great work, and, and Mr. Chaffetz has been over there a number of times himself, they have done great work, but, uh, uh, you know, and I, and I see that uh, DOD has made some changes in their contracting protocols, and that is good, but I, I don't think it is enough. I don't think it is enough. I think we have got to get a better handle on this, 
And I think, uh, I, I think it needs to be a, a tighter rein and, and a greater concern for the, the, theft, the theft of billions of dollars of American taxpayer money. Uh, the American people are doing a, a good thing. They, they, they are trying their best to, to help a country uh, gain stability. But our, our kindness and our generosity is being abused in this case. And uh, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. And uh, we need to put systems in place that will prevent that abuse from continuing. We are partners in this. We are partners in this, uh, the, the Congress and, and DOD. We have to make sure that this we tighten up this system uh, and, and uh, address some of the concerns that Mr. Mr. Tierney has uncovered. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We record. will now recognize our panel. Mr. Gary Motzek is the Director, Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Mr. Kim Denver is the Deputy Assistant for the Army for Procurement, and Brigadier General Steve Townsend is the Director of the Joint Staff Pakistan-Afghanistan Pakistan Coordination Cell. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you. In order to allow time for discussion, if you would please uh, limit your verbal testimony to five minutes and whatever materials and uh, statement that you have uh, for the record will be uh, submitted in its entirety. So we will start with Mr. Motzak. You are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Ch Chairman Chavez, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee, uh, Congressman Lynch. I wish I had written what you just wrote. Uh, I rarely would ever say this, but I would like to align myself with your remarks as well. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today and discuss the efforts of the Defense Department to reduce and control contracting corruption in Afghanistan. This is an update to our testimony that we gave last June, and I hope we can, in fact, demonstrate that we have made some progress. Contractors continue to provide critical support to operations in Afghanistan. The use of local national contractors in particular is a key to the counterinsurgency or coin strategy of our commanding general. They currently make up 40 percent, 47 percent of the DOD contractor workforce in Afghanistan. There is no doubt that the strategy that promotes Afghan first carries risk. However, it is clear that the coin strategy is essential to developing a stable Afghanistan. Recognizing the essential role of contractors in September 2010, as been noted previously, the commander of ISAF published his counterinsurgency contracting guidance. This guidance stressed that everyone must understand the role of contracting and counterinsurgency and how it could not only benefit but undermine our efforts in Afghanistan. Due in no small part to the concerns of this committee, Task Force 2010 was established by that same commander to address contracting corruption and its negative impact to that coin strategy. The task force consists of individuals from the uniformed services and includes civilian representatives from a variety of contracting, auditing, and criminal investigating agencies. The team most importantly includes contract forensic accountants who assist the task force in tracing money through the Afghan domestic and international financial networks. I need not remind the committee that is probably the toughest part of this job as we all recognize. One of the key efforts of Task Force 2010 undertook was the assessment of the host nation trucking count contract. We are thankful for this committee's June 2010 report, which served as an important resource. The host nation trucking assessment looked at eight prime companies that supported the contract to evaluate the extent, if any, that the power brokers, criminal elements, and insurgents have had on the execution of those services. I know that one of the specific concerns of this committee was our use of a particular private security contractor. And during last year's testimony, I committed to ensuring action would be taken. Uh, immediately upon the departure from this committee, we suspended operations with that contractor. On August 4, 2011, the Army entered into an administrative agreement with that private security contractor that stipulates he will not provide convoy security for a period of three years. In accordance with this administrative agreement, 
we have ceased to use this security contractor for convoy security. There are a number of direct actions taken as a result of the 2010 host nation trucking assessment. The most significant action was the contracting command's decision to execute a new contract vehicle to address the challenges we had with the previous contract. Specifically, the new contract vehicle expands the potential number of prime contractors, establishes new standards of conduct, and a variety of ways of applying security. Due to the complexity of this new contract and to meet operational requirements, we continued to use host nation trucking vehicle with additional controls until the performance could be started under the new contract, which is tomorrow. And to address the concerns in, that we, you have expressed with the host nation trucking. We have put together a comprehensive strategy that should drive business away from the bad actors, enable smaller companies to prosper, and to meet the vast arrays of our complex needs. With a potential of nearly $1 billion, we must execute this program with care and vigilance. This is one of but several actions taken by the Task Force 2010. Other additional examples include the debarment of 78 individuals or companies, the suspension and pending debarment of a, an additional 42, and the referral to the appropriate debarment official of an additional 111 persons or companies. We continue to pursue a wide range of correction actions. However, we can't do this alone. As you are aware, Task Force 2010 is but a part of a larger organization that is operating that. Of course, challenges remain, and our concerted effort to control corruption in contracting must persist. With the commander's commitment, which we now have without any doubt, and the participation of the international community, we will continue to make progress. I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Denver, you are recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on National Security, Homeland Defense, and Foreign Operations, thank you for the invitation to appear today to discuss Army efforts to reduce contracting corruption in Afghanistan. I am pleased to represent Army leadership, members of the Army Acquisition and Contracting Workforce, and our soldiers who rely on us for timely and efficient material, supplies, and services in support of expeditionary operations. When our Army deploys, it depends on civilian support from contractors. As you are aware, the past decade has brought unprecedented challenges to contingency contracting. We have operated in theaters where the culture includes corrupt business practices. In spite of this environment, Army personnel supporting CENTCOM strive to uphold the integrity of the procurement process and our fiduciary responsibility to the American public. We appreciate congressional attention to contingency contracting by several amendments in the current version of the FY12 National Defense Authorization Act, as well as the investigative reports last year on host nation trucking and private security contractors. Oversight of subcontractors has been a significant concern of the contracting community, the audit agencies, and Congress. In response, we have trained over 9,600 contracting officer representatives, COR's, instituted vetting procedures, and increased transparency by mandating government approval of all subcontractors. COR's are on the front lines of our contracting oversight as responsible stewards of American taxpayer dollars. In December 2009, the Army rejuvenated our COR management and training by mandating that deploying brigades have as many as 80 soldiers trained to COR's. The vetting of host nation contractors is a key element in fighting corruption and ensuring security for U.S. warfighters, civilians, and contractors as well as the security of the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan. It has been a struggle to create a vetting process for a country that lacks universal identification criteria. Biometric identification, although time-consuming and still relatively new, provides the most reliable means to ensure security. The continued use of contractor vetting and biometric information reduces the risk of contracting with bad actors and creates a more secure environment. Let me take a moment to provide an update on how we have refined and improved our systems and processes in respect to transportation contracts. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, we paid serious attention to the findings and recommendations from this Committee's Warlord, Inc. report. The National Afghan Trucking Contract, NAT, addresses these concerns. This new transportation contract was awarded by the CENTCOM Joint Theater Support Contracting Command last month and includes stricter oversight and performance controls than the previous host nation trucking contract, HNT. NAT ensures greater transparency into subcontracts, includes a code of ethics, 
significantly expands the number of prime contractors, ensures prior vetting, and establishes a tiered rate structure based on security requirements and separates contracts into suites to encourage smaller and local companies to participate. The H&T contract ends today. Execution of the NAT contract begins tomorrow. The increase in the number of available contractors from 8 to 20 on the NAT enables greater competition, leading to more work for companies that perform responsibly. It also provides the flexibility to suspend problem contractors as well as to facilitate the development of the trucking industry in Afghanistan. NAT incorporates congressional recommendations on the role of Afghan national security forces in highway security. NAT inventories actual trucking assets available to DOD on a daily basis and it ensures transparency, vetting, past performance information of all contractors and subcontractors. As a result, NAT will reduce costs, pay only for services performed, and incentivize timely delivery resulting in improved oversight and performance. Army contracting continues to identify more effective ways to ensure that we get the most value of our contracting dollars and the most effective support for our warfighters. I cannot stress enough the complexity of managing countless requirements, overseeing tens of thousands of contractors, and awarding billions of dollars in procurement in an environment that is already hostile on many levels. The endemic corruption in Afghanistan remains a challenge to our contracting personnel. It will take time to change this environment. The U.S. Army remains committed to the protection of the interests of the United States, our warfighters, and our taxpayers through excellence in all contracting activities. Thank you for your continued support, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Denver. We will now recognize Brigadier, Brigadier General Townsend for five minutes. Chairman Chaffetz, uh, Ranking Member Tierney, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thanks for this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss uh, our efforts to link contracting and the flow of U.S. contracting dollars to our counterinsurgency strategy in Afghanistan. The bottom line up front is we must recognize we, recognize we must see and address the challenges we face with corruption and popular perceptions in Afghanistan. Even as our supplies are flowing to our warfighters, uh, they arrive with good reliability, surprisingly little disruption and pilferage, and with low investment or loss in U.S. lives and battlefield resources. The focal point for our coin strategy in Afghanistan is to deny terrorists safe havens and secure the Afghan people. Our effective management of our government's contracting dollars is essential to the success of this strategy. As you all know, after 30 years of war and social devolution, corruption is a tremendous challenge in Afghanistan. Uh, Congressman Lynch, you so eloquently said that corruption is a greater threat to st the stability of Afghanistan than the Taliban. Uh, I would agree, and so would many of the other soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that I was privileged to serve with in re uh, Regional Command East recently. Uh, deterring this corruption involves an integrated effort at all levels, so we can see where our money is going to gain an awareness and a level of control over the unintended consequences of our spending. We have and will continue to take appropriate steps to reduce the effects of corruption and be good stewards of the American taxpayers' dollar. The U.S. military has greatly increased our understanding of the corruption problem and the unintended consequences of contracting dollars can have on our coin effort in theater. This committee's Warlord Inc. report was very helpful to that increased awareness and understanding. Uh, since last year, you have heard here, we have taken a number of steps to combat corruption uh, we have established combined and joint interagency task force, Shafafiat, that is a Dari word meaning transparency. That has helped to map out the criminal patronage networks that exist in Afghanistan and to address corruption as a strategic problem. Uh, task Force Spotlight has aided in tracking and enforcing procedures regarding private security companies. And Task Force 2010 has given us a better understanding with whom we are doing business and providing commanders and contracting activities with the information they need to take informed action. I visited with Task Force 2010 just three days ago to see how they are doing. Uh, under Army Brigadier General Ross Ridge, Task Force 2010's accomplishments include a detailed study of the host nation trucking contract, which has led to identification of key changes they have been making to contracting practices. These have now been integrated into the new National Afghan Trucking Contract. This new contract will provide a better understanding of transportation service costs and significantly increase the number of prime contractors, which you have already heard. 
Uh, they have also identified individuals and companies for referral, for uh, debarment, for not performing responsibly. Uh, perhaps even more important than these actions they have taken in mitigation are the preventative actions that they have taken. Uh, Task Force 2010 has implemented, including working closely with CENTCOM's contracting command and to share information across the theater to include with uh, Embassy Kabul, uh, USAID, uh, NATO, and other partners. This vetting process helps identify high-risk contractors before agreements are entered. I have highlighted just a few of these efforts uh, that DOD is making to counter the effects of corruption on our coin operations in Afghanistan. Uh, these initiatives underscore our focus to overcome the significant challenges we face in Afghanistan and will help us improve how we are performing now and in the future. Thanks for your continuous support of our men and women in uniform and for this opportunity to appear before you today. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, gentlemen. I uh, will now recognize uh, the ranking member, as it has been uh, said before, has really uh, uh, done some uh, uh, very important work on this subject. We will now recognize uh, Mr. Tierney for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your testimony, gentlemen. And I, I want to start by saying, look, your, your testimony highlighted uh, the creation of Task Force 2010 and Task Force uh, Shafa Fayet. Uh, it is a major signal, you say, for showing how serious you are about attempting to understand all of the problems with corruption um, that are going on contracting in Afghanistan. I think those are good efforts. I praise them in my opening remarks. But I do have a significant problem seeing any tangible evidence of them uh, really being put into serious action at this point in time. Mr. Mossack, uh, last year when you were in front of the committee, you did, as you said in your testimony here today, assure us that uh, you, our concerns about Commander Rahula and Watan risk management uh, would be taken seriously and that you would start action. And I understand that you did. Uh, start action on uh, debarment uh, for those two individuals on that. In fact, the Army announced its uh, suspension of debarment and uh, made a, a big deal out of that fact, and I think it rightfully was. The Task Force 2010 found that significant sums of money from that company uh, had gone to insurgents while Commander Ruhula, Ruhula uh, served as the principal security provider. Now, the findings of that committee. You understand, first of all, that our committee investigation was a committee investigation. It doesn't substitute for a Department of Defense investigation or DOJ. Is that right? Sir, that is a source document. That is correct. So I was a little disappointed when I learned that uh, without further investigation, uh, this went to a hearing and then the Army basically cut a deal uh, with both Rahula and the uh, trucking company, the, the Wonton, uh, tr Wonton Trucking Company. So Mr. Rahula claimed that he hadn't uh, understood what was going on in the investigation, which I would propose is nonsense. But at any rate, I was disappointed that the Army hadn't done its own investigation and nailed down those facts in a way that wouldn't allow for that kind of a, a determination. Secondly, they let Watton off the hook by basically saying, well, you can't do any more host nation trucking contracting for three years. The company was already out of that business. So that wasn't much of a punishment on that basis. So you have a... a According to the Task Force 2010, a, a warlord, a, a bad actor, malign actor, Rahutula, now free to contract with the United States. And you have Watan, uh, free to contract and everything but uh, an enterprise that they already decided to get out. I'm not sure you could feel comfortable thinking that you fulfilled your promise to this committee. How do you feel about it? Sir, when we, when we, we came together, we said we would, do, we would take under advisement, and I, I believe I used the term in your in your investigation, anything that was in there was actionable, we would deal with it immediately. And so uh, the short-term solutions, as you recall, we had some issues with arming, uh, which was the, the primary reason that we were able to suspend uh, Watan Group at the, uh, at the initial outset, and we continued to march forward. Task Force 2010 did, in fact, do additional work with regards to uh, both uh, cases that you talk, talk to. What is important in my mind to, to remember is that debarment by the Code of Federal, Federal Regulation and your own excellent Congressional Research Service shows this over and over again, should not be interpreted as punishment. Debarments are there to protect the interests of the United States. Well, you know, I, I'll grant you that point. Sure. So how is, you know, the 2010's findings were that some $1.7 million were made in payments by Rahula, he received them, and passed them on to malign actors. All right, uh, and they found the fact that he was not such an upstanding character himself. 
he was working in concert with Watan uh, Contracting Company. So let's assume that what you say is true and you don't want to punish them. Let's protect ourselves from having contracts with them. And wouldn't that require debarment as a basis for protecting us by having to deal with these malign characters again? Again, this is a, the, uh, the process, as you well know, you have an independent senior uh, uh, suspension department official that makes the judgment based on facts that are presented to him. Uh, well, without, well, without reading too much into his decision, yeah. he believes, and he is the deciding official, yeah. that the interests of the government, in fact, were protected because you cannot go into, he has agreed that you will not go into additional uh, contracts with them for a period of three years. On, if they try to go around the corner, but he's, he fired them basically doing business they had already given up, and there were a host of others. Watan Management Company is basically the Papal brothers, right? Cousins to, to President Karzai. They, they, right. So let's just get it out on the table here, basically, or like that. They got themselves a deal uh, by appealing this, and they got Rahatula, uh, basically a, a warlord of malign character, off the hook as well. well I, said, I, I don't find that satisfactory. I'm sorry. I, I just don't find it. And, and General Townsend, I, I appreciate your testimony, but when I saw on page two, that you said in some cases the Afghan populace perceives that our money is not positively benefiting Afghan people and instead is supporting power brokers and malign actors. It's not a perception, is it? It's fact. Task Force 2010 found, in fact, that money was going to malign actors. That, that's fair. It's a fact that it's also a perception amongst the people. Okay. So we'll, we'll both get it down on that. But I mean, it, it, it's a problem that we have here, all right? And it, ha and it has to be stopped. Now, the other part of, of this thing is that we have a serious issue on that. What are we going to do about it? We have the, the task force finding that basically tells us that uh, we have choices. We have use of United States or ISAF forces to protect the convoys, but we really want to use them in other ways and don't have enough of them to put them in protection. Is that fair to say? Part of the theory on this? Yes, sir. All right. Two, you could use the Afghan National Security Forces, except they're not ready and they're not able to at this point in time. Is that a fair statement? Uh, that's that's fair for now. Uh, we're right. working on that. So you're working on it, but it's uh, it's a ways from from happening. So th what does that leave you with? To protect the convoys and, and to get this done. Uh, for now, private security companies, uh, as we build the Afghan Public Protection Force. So we're right back to the same people that were involved in the problem that uh, instigated the investigation. Now, let's talk about our control. One of the things that we found in the investigation was that. Uh, there was little going on to actually oversee and manage these contracts. And, and I know that some of your regulations have addressed that. Um, but let me tell me a little bit about whether this is happening on the street. Are people going outside the gate uh, and observing those convoys? Are they riding along on those convoys? Are they auditing and taking uh, in investigations and inspections to make sure that things in those trucks are getting from one point to another? Is there physically uh, people out there doing it, or are they just relying on reports and somebody's word that these things have been done? Um, I don't. I wouldn't say that every con convoy is uh, observed or uh, escorted, but I think significantly more of them now are than were a year ago. Mr. Matzik, sir, if you recall, last time I was here, uh, our biggest deficiency with regards to the PSCs were we were failing to follow our own procedures, which required the dual licensing process, as as we recall that. Uh, if you're going to use a PSC, it must be duly licensed in the in the country, and we had an arming and vetting procedure that we were supposed to follow. And in this particular time, with regards to Watan, at the, as the uh, subcontractor, we had failed to do that. Uh, Task Force Spotlight under uh, uh, General Bohr, one of their, her primary functions was to get her handle hands around that licensing and vetting process, which we should have done before. The other piece that has occurred since we, we discussed the last time is, if you recall, we had temporary uh, rules in the Code of Federal Regula Regulation regarding the use of private security contractors overseas. And they not only apply to us, but they apply to our, uh, our sister agencies. Since we have met, we have been able to finally push through the final rules, which are a substantial improvement over the originals. So they were published uh, about uh, six or eight weeks ago. Uh, that was not an easy process to get them through the CFR, and that's my fault. But they, but they are out there. So that process, and those procedures are in place. The visibility, because of President Karzai's decree 62, and the efforts to come up with the uh, the other option, uh, is driving 
this entire institution inside Afghan to a, di to a different standard right now. As you know, we are not going to be giving up PSCs as a nation overall. The diplomatic side of the House will continue to use them. So in, in retrospect, yes, in the short term we will use them, but our intention is to have the options to use the other, the other two alternatives. Gentlemen's time has expired. I um, now recognize myself for five minutes. Can we get a grip here on the uh, the dollars? And uh, uh, I, I want to understand what is also being transported, because my understanding is there is a difference as to how, what the actual physical materials that are that are being transferred. So, um, do we have a sense, uh, percentage wise, dollar wise, of what we think we have lost, what has been pilfered through? through this trucking process? If I could take that question, yes, sir. As it relates to the H&T contract, I would have to take the question for the record in terms of getting you the specific items. But we understand that uh, about $700 million has actually been paid out. And we've, when we you have say paid out? Paid to, paid to the contractors for their services, for the transportation that they provided. But we have about $145 million uh, in penalties and withholds that relate to um, lost equipment, uh, pilferage. Uh, do, we, do we have a total value of what had been shipped and what had been lost, pilfered, or simply didn't make it to its destination? I, I could take that for the record and get it to you, sir. Uh, my understanding is, though, with the Task Force uh, 2010 being stood up, that a number of items have been, reco have been recovered. Do you know the value of what has been recovered? About $172 million in recovered uh, losses. And what would be included in the list of the $172 million that was recovered? Uh, I think probably just about anything we transport, uh, you know, a piece of just about anything we transport on the roads from, from uh, unit equipment to uh, general purpose uh, supplies. Uh, to kind of get at your question of a second ago, uh, we transport roughly 1.5 million gallons of fuel uh, per day uh, in Afghanistan, and roughly half of our cargo is moving uh, on the ground. But there is certain cargo that is not transported via this. That's right. What, what, Some of the recent the press accounts have talked about uh, ammunition being transported uh, in these uh, convoys, and, and, and that is not the practice in Afghanistan. Uh, ammunition is typically transported only in a U.S. military escorted convoy and not in uh, convoys that are uh, secured by private security companies or uh, moving unsecured. So with these private security companies providing uh, the transportation and security, um, uh, do we do sensitive electronics in those shipments, thumb drives and those types of things? I think uh, one of the, we do have some electronics that, that track what the electronics do. We have in-transit uh, vehicle uh, transponders that... Uh, I, I, I'm talking about the, the content of what's actually behind those. Sir, the, uh, the standard is no Class 5, no ammunition, and what we, what we have is a class of supply that's called sensitive items. Uh, the simplest answer I would give you, things such as night vision goggles would not be permitted to be transported by... Uh, by them. Uh, loaded computers would not be allowed to be transported by them. Uh, we could take it for the record to give you a weapons, large Would list. weapons be on that list? Uh, no, they are sensitive items. They would not be transported by them. Uh, uniforms? Uh, uniforms were uh, transported in these types of convoys earlier in the effort. Uh, we have made uh, large efforts to reduce that now because of uh, problems with that you reduce that, or are you going to eliminate? That? I think we probably the goal is to eliminate it, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that we've eliminated that completely. That's not too reassuring. I appreciate the candor, though. Uh, medical equipment. There's a Wall Street Journal uh, report that I would appreciate you familiarizing yourself with. That came out uh, just in the last couple of weeks, talking about some of the horrendous and, ter and horrific uh, situations that are happening. Uh, in Afghanistan. The article is entitled, At Afghan Military Hospital, a Graft and Deadly Neglect. There are oversight and issues there, but specifically I know we are talking about the transportation issues. Uh, I would appreciate it if you would uh, look at this article dated uh, September 3rd of, of, of this year uh, as well. Um, 
one of the other uh, deep concerns here is that these that we're not doing our job on the ground, and I, I recognize in the theater of war and all that's happening, um, the, there 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 is a uh, an added degree of pressure that I'm sure only those in theater that can uh, can appreciate. But one of these reports said that often the containers were never counted or reopened once they got to their destination. What assurance can you give to this committee that you're actually solving that problem? Because it's pretty easy to tell. You should be able to tell what left and what arrived. And yet, these uh, the reports that we're getting saying that that checkpoint at the end just doesn't happen when our when our men and women receive these materials. I think I can. The ground truth out there is that the vast majority of everything that shows up at a base gets opened and checked. It gets received. It gets looked at. Is there a percentage of the stuff that's moving on these lines of communication that doesn't get received or inspected? Yes, I'd say there probably is. And I'd just give you a simple vignette to describe this one from my own experience. Um, uh, we found in a yard. Uh, we took. You know, uh, we did a transition with the unit before us. Uh, we started inventorying everything on our base, and we found a series of containers there locked up. So well, what are these containers? The, the last unit didn't take them with them. Well, we started opening them up and discovering parts that had been ordered over time. Uh, you know, supplies have been ordered over a period of time. So the unit, may, the unit ahead of us maybe hadn't even ordered it. And uh, so these things arrive, and you, you, know, you, you do your best to uh, account for your equipment. And now you start accounting for someone else's equipment that may be on your base. Uh, so that's kind of how it transpires. But yes, there's a tremendous effort to, uh, for units to account for their stuff. when it Well, not, and not just their stuff, but checking the manifest as to what was shipped of course. and did it actually arrive. Sure. Yes, Mr. Denver, and then I'll, I'll yield back. If I may, Chairman, let me talk a little bit about the, the process, uh, what's happening and what we're doing in the contract to get our hands around the pilferage and, and addressing this issue. Uh, First, there's an understanding that the um, that, that a uh, transportation mission request is sent to, the, to these contractors, and within that transportation mission request, it identifies exactly what is to be um, transported uh, and and the trucks that it, we would need to transport further. Within the uh, convoys, uh, we have um, if there's uh, sensitive equipment or equipment that can be pilfered, we actually seal these trucks so that uh, if they are unsealed. Um, we're aware of it when they get to destination. Uh, if we find a situation where that has occurred, if there's pilfering or if there's, the seal has been broken, that results in a failed mission. With that particular failed mission, what happens is the contractor does not receive payment for that mission. The other thing that happens is they also, within the contract, we've built a, uh, a deduct that relates to their total mission throughout the, each month. And if there's instances of pilferage, we have percentage deducts that take off a deduction on their invoices for that monthly uh, shipment, and that would uh, be withheld from their uh, from their invoices. Uh, so we're we're taking a number of uh, steps to identify that. The other thing we're doing, I would say, is with DCMA. Um, the intent on the previous contract, we did not have a random inspection method. Uh, in the future, on the uh, NAT contract, we will have uh, DCMA at the gate, both in where origin and destination, and. Uh, but it will be random so that we can conduct spot checks. Those spot checks would be based on what was shipped, the, the um, condition of the trucks. It would also involve security personnel being checked that they are appropriate and they're badged and licensed. Uh, but, but the real answer here is are we putting in the oversight? The oversight takes uh, more than just Contracting, it takes the defense contract management agency, it takes the contract officer, it, it takes the requirement side. And, and do we have a log of, the, of what is been mis what is missing and the value of it? I would have to take that for the, for the record and get that back to you, sir. Thank you. Chairman, yield for a second. Yes. Chairman, yeah, I just it's an appropriate time, I think, to make note of one thing here, and I'd like to have unanimous consent to put this on the record, if I could. This is a uh, sheet that the department made available to us uh, with respect to oil deliveries. All right, and it's a multi-page item in the red you see with the amount or the percentage of shortage on delivery. And basically, I'll tell you, there's mostly zeros. That zero delivered out of, you know, we should have been 100 percent, mostly zeros on that to significant uh, occasions. Now, we're also told that $25,000 is the penalty they pay for not uh, delivering a full load, yet the value of this is over $40,000 on the street. 
So I am not sure we have got our penalties aligned with, uh, with the price on that. And something certainly have been done. But there is 1,100 trucks delivering oil that were pilfered, uh, 5.4 million gallons of fuel gone. No explanation on that. So I hope that we are addressing that. And I just ask Mr. Chairman if we could put that on the record. Without objection, uh, we will enter it into the record. Uh, I will yield back. And, uh, uh, yes, General. I just like to put a little, put that into a little bit of context. Uh, you're right; fuel uh, uh, pilferage rates are higher than we want them to be. Uh, overall, pilferage rates on the ground locks in Afghanistan is about one percent, plus or minus. So that's the overall context of what we're talking about here. Still, at the you know the level of our endeavor in Afghanistan, that's still a lot of stuff. One percent even. Uh, with fuel, it is as high as 15 percent. And part of that is, uh, Congressman, what you just pointed out there about our penalty may not uh, be offsetting the actual street value of this commodity. And this is a discussion I had with General Ridge just about three days ago. He recognizes this and is working on adjusting that uh, penalty. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Mr. Lynch, for five minutes, or maybe a little more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I, want, I want to thank you for coming before the committee and helping us. Uh, like I said before, this is, this is one team, one fight, and uh, we are all trying to do the right thing here. Uh, we had an opportunity, uh, myself, I believe the chairman, uh, and several of our staffers here, Mr. Alexander was there, uh, Mr. Lindsay was there, I think Mr. Fernandez from my office was there, but we, we went into uh, Kandahar and we went down that Route 4. Uh, that uh, leaves from Karachi, uh, goes up through Quetta, and then uh, goes into Afghanistan. Um, the major seaport there is Karachi in, in, in Pakistan, and then these trucks leave, and uh, the Pakistani trucking outfits take over at a place called Spin Bolduck that we went into. That is controlled by a fellow by the name of, uh, he's now General Razik. Now, uh, they had, uh, you know, they had threatened if we went in there to do oversight on the trucking operation that they would shut the border down. Uh, and there's there's thousands of trucks going through there, uh, you know, in the course of a day. And so when we, on behalf of Mr. Tierney at the time, he was the chairman, uh, went down there to inspect, they shut shut it down just as they had threatened. So you know. First of all, we couldn't refuse to go down there and do our jobs uh, doing oversight, but, but he followed through on his threat and he shut the, shut the, uh, the, the trucking center there, the, the border crossing down uh, until we left. You know, we did as much uh, oversight and inspection that we could, and then when we left, the oversight committee left, then he opened up the border again. And it was, just, you know, myself, we had a, a striker brigade with us. We didn't go down there by ourselves, but. Uh, you know, God bless them. Uh, you know that that's pretty tight control when you can shut off the oversight of the United States Congress and 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 DoD and 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 the military did what they could to get us in there to do the oversight. But that that vignette is is, is one that troubles me greatly. That uh, here we are uh, spending billions of dollars in taxpayer money. We go down there. We're, we're elected by the folks that are actually paying the freight here. We go down to inspect what's going on there, and you got this. He's, he's, he's a general now. He was a colonel back then. He's a warlord, is what he is, uh, Razik, and he's got a. This is all sort of Taliban-controlled territory that we drove through from Kandahar down to down to Bol, Spin Bolduck. And and I just uh, I got to tell you. You know, it's a whole lawless area, and if the guy can shut off Congress from from conducting reasonable oversight, then what what chance do we have of of implementing a system where we actually perform due diligence on protecting the taxpayers' money? It's just a you know, I just have great misgivings about this, and unless you know, look. We have some leverage here. They need our help. We need to use that leverage to make sure that they, they operate by our standards. We shouldn't be operating 
under the Wild West standards that they operate under. And that's, that's sort of what's going on here. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I think it goes right from the top, from, from Karzai on down. It's just, uh, it's just rotten from top to bottom over there. And, uh, you know, the goodness and the generosity of the American people is being abused. Here, here they are trying to do the right thing. I know the president's got a withdrawal plan there, but in the meantime, he's trying to do the right thing. The, 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 the average Afghan over there is in a desperate strait, and, we, and we're trying to do the right thing from a humanitarian standpoint. We're trying to stand up that country so they can take care of themselves. But in the meanwhile, we're getting fleeced by the very people we're trying to help, or, or a certain portion of it. Right, right. I don't think the average Afghan is really, you know, as malicious as these folks. But it's a game. It's a game. And, and now, in the economy that we got right now, I mean, we could never afford this, ever. But especially now, it is just heartbreaking to see the resources of the American people abused uh, and, and stolen in this fashion. And, and to have, you know, some two-bit warlord down there, uh, you know, blocking off the United States Congress from doing its constitutional duty to, to make sure that the, the appropriated monies here by the American people are getting to the source that they're, they're, they're targeted to and, and, and spent in a way that's consistent with our mission, this just can't, this can't go on. So, uh, you know, and, and I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I appreciate you, you're uh, tweaking the contract, I, going from 8 to 20. That's helpful, get a little competition. But uh, uh, how, next time I go down to spend Bulldog, am I going to face the same, same situation where they're blocking the Oversight com Committee from going in down there? Sir, very possibly. I mean, you hit the nail, I, in my mind, in your opening comments on the head. Uh, what we're doing in the, in the, the core of the, this uh, hearing has to do with a couple of contracts. But, but you hit the, the larger issue, which, and Congressman Tierney has, has raised it, as has the chairman, that this is, this is a society that is based on 3,000 plus years of doing things this way and 30 long years of war, and we are not going to change it overnight. I mean, that's the frustration we have. So the, the metrics of the number of uh, convictions I have are interesting and they're important, but the real issue is the efforts, quite frankly, that that larger task force is doing to trying to engage to change, change the change the the tone so that you have a judicial system that you can trust, you have a police system that you can trust, you have a leadership system that is that you can trust, and it goes back to uh, Congressman Tierney's comment about who's related to who and 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 what's going on. That is not going to happen overnight. I think we all recognize that. I don't think it's going to happen in a thousand years. The, uh, and, and it may not. It may not. The, but the fact that, and in no small part, again, because of this, this committee, we're not taking the narrow view. The narrow view would have been Task Force 2010 and Spotlight. But to have the overarching view, which pulls in our other partners, our international partners, it pulls in the ISAF side of the House. So we've got to look at it directly. We get the right words. Make no mistake, we get the right words from the senior leadership about the importance of corruption and controlling corruption. And years ago, we didn't even get the right words. And my frustration, and I'm sure everyone's frustration is the same as yours, is what's tolerable. My personal opinion is we are not going to eliminate corruption. We're not in our lifetime. Our efforts right now should be centered on primarily controlling the corruption that we can control so that our interests and our dollars and our values and our resources are protected as are our allies' resources. But I, I, I share, you know, what happens to you is you go in and as soon as you leave, unless we have a presence there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we take risk that, uh, that, that it will transition back to exactly as you said. So right. we all share your frustration, uh, but, I, but I would say that uh, the fact that we are looking broadly, and that is going to be very tough to measure, and as you know, I can't give you metrics that says that the, 
executive branch of Afghanistan is now good because of these four metrics. Yeah. It, the proof will be in the, you know, the proof will be if we can reduce the numbers. The only number we'll be able to show you is a reduction in the number, the dollar value of corruption. That will be the bottom line when we, when we come for you again. The, the, gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. I want to make sure that we have time for Mr. Yermuth of, of Kentucky yeah. here. So I will now recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to use part of my time to make a uni uh, unanimous consent request to insert a document into the record. Last month, Ranking Member Cummings sent a letter to Chairman Issa requesting authorization for me to join a congressional delegation to Afghanistan led by Senator Wyden. The purpose of the delegation was to investigate allegations of contracting fraud and corruption. As today's hearing demonstrates, this subcommittee has done great work on this issue. And given recent media reports and the testimony we're hearing today, it's clear we must continue this oversight uh, of this very important issue. As a member of the subcommittee, uh, I wanted to join Senator Wyden's delegation to press U.S. officials for answers to exactly the kinds of questions we are examining today. That's why I was extremely disappointed that Chairman Issa rejected my request. His rationale was that Democrats from our committee should not be allowed to join bipartisan delegations unless a Republican from our committee also joins. This is a misguided policy that has no basis in House rules or policies. The policy established by Speaker Pelosi and continued by Speaker Boehner is that every foreign delegation must be bipartisan and that it include a Republican and Democrat from each committee. No, I'm sorry, not that it include a Republican and Democrat from each committee. Senator Wyden's delegation meets this standard because it has another Republican House member, Representative David Schweikert. Both the Committee on House Administration and the Office of Interparliamentary Affairs have confirmed that this misguided policy is not the Speaker's, but Chairman Issa's alone. So I am asking unanimous consent to include a letter Ranking Member Cummings sent to Chairman Issa this morning requesting him to immediately reverse this policy. Thank you. I'm going to hold off a ruling on that. Would you mind if I had a chance to look at the letter, please? Certainly. You may continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This conversation that I, uh, Mr. Lynch has talked about the um, the use of uh, the misuse of taxpayer dollars and the waste of taxpayer dollar, American taxpaying dollars, uh, that sometimes go to our uh, people we're trying to help. And in fact, according to the Task Force 2010 reports of uh, uh, Task Force 2010, it indicated that they've identified $360 million that has been diverted to insurgents and power brokers and warlords and so forth. Some of that money, presumably funding the very insurgency that our counterinsurgency is designed to uh, combat. So, General, as, as you talked about the counterinsurgency strategy, I'd like to ask you, to what extent do you think these diverted funds are undermining the counterinsurgency strategy, and to what extent they're being used to attack our own troops, and if, do you think we're doing enough to uh, make sure that we're not funding attacks on our own men and women? Thanks for the question, Congressman. I, I think that uh, I, I had this conversation with uh, General Ridge a couple of days ago, and uh, that $360 million that they have identified that you cited there is from uh, a look at $31 billion of contracts. So that is a little bit of context there, $31 billion and the $360 million. Mm -hmm. That is still a tremendous amount of right. money. If it is if it's correct, that is really bad. Um, so I don't know how you can quantify how much of that money has actually. I think that money, part of it, is probably going to just simple crime that would exist mm -hmm. in any society. Uh, some of that money, for sure, is going to, uh, I think, the insurgency. And then how much I can't quantify mm -hmm. how much that money is going to a tax against us versus mm -hmm. some other insurgent purpose. Clear, it's clear to us some of that money is going in the insurgency, and we've got to do whatever we can to to stop that. I don't, I don't think you can completely stop it, but we've got to do whatever we can to minimize it. Mm. Um, there's, there's nobody in uniform over there who likes to hear that our, first of all, everybody in uniform over there is a taxpayer, too. Uh, and they don't like to hear that our tax dollars are going into uh, funding the guys that we're trying to fight. So I, I think that uh, 
what I can say is we got the processes in place. Partially due to the efforts of this committee, we have the processes in place now to address it. Um, but it would be hard to quantify, I think, how much of that money is actually going to the insurgency. Clearly, some, some is too much. But you, you do have a strategy or are working to develop a strategy for trying to determine how, where, how it is getting to the insurgents and stopping that? There is. Well, well absolutely. You have got a couple of organizations, Task Force Shafafiat, that is their job is to do the overall strategic anti-corruption effort. And they integrate the efforts of some of these other organizations like 2010. They also integrate our efforts across not just the U.S. government, the Afghan government, and also our NATO and other uh, partners there. Uh, so that you, the, there are other organizations over there, the Afghan Threat Finance Cell. I attended a briefing with uh, Chairman Mullen just about a week ago on, by the Afghan Threat Finance Cell. And they are an intelligence organization and they are an uh, interagency organization. And their job is to delve into this and, and, and point folks out. And, and uh, I can tell you that we they are certainly taking action there. Well, I would hope that um, to the extent that you can, you can report to the, the subcommittee as to progress you have made and of any discoveries you have made about how this process may be going on and whether you have had any success in stopping it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the ge gentleman yields back. Thank you. The gentleman had previously uh, requested unanimous consent to insert a record, uh, a letter dated September 15, 2011, without objection. So ordered. Now recognize the, the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, you know, I want to stay on this topic a little bit here because it, part of it is the money. Uh, nobody wants to lose the money of the taxpayers like that. The, the larger part of it is what is it doing to our operation in Afghanistan in terms of this counterinsurgency um, angle that we have taken over there. And one aspect of that, as I understand it from General Petraeus' own writings, is that you know, corruption and feeding into corruption is not going to be helpful is one of the main things that has to not happen in order for the counterinsurgency to be effective. So the publicly available legal documents that were filed by Watton in the case, they had it said, um, said this, Watton argued that the alleged bribes were not bribes, per se, but rather facilitation payments. They argued that Watton had no choice but to pay Afghan government officials and other armed groups for police protection while Watton transported cargo for the United States military through Afghan's volatile war zone. Uh, General Towson, do you agree that the uh, security operators and contractors had no choice but to make those payments? I, I do agree that in many cases they don't have a choice, and they or they perceive that they don't have a choice. They perceive that they'll be attacked if they don't make uh, some of these payments. Uh, and, and Mr. Mossick, do you agree with Watan's analysis that these so-called facilitation payments? or bribes, as some of us might say, large sums of cash provided to provincial governors, to local police or warlords in order to ensure that the trucks aren't bothered. Do you think that uh, that is legal under the United States law? Clearly is not. It is clearly, and it is counterproductive to what we are trying to do. And it, again, it is part of the larger systemic problem that we have. So here is what Watton's court filing goes on to state. The Army allowed and encouraged HNT contractors to do and pay whatever was necessary to ensure convoy security and prevent loss of life. The Army engaged in the affirmative misconduct by encouraging private contractors to undertake activities that the Army only disavowed once they were exposed to the public. Uh, Mr. Denver, uh, was the Army aware of the apparently common practice of facilitation payments, and does it encourage people like Watton to make them? I am not familiar with uh, with whether the Army had that information, I would tell you this. Uh, in, in conversations that I, when I um, had a meeting with the suspension and debarment official, uh, I think uh, he indicated the same that, that you have heard today, that the facilitation payments were necessary. So in that context, I would say when Watan came to the table and identified what they paid, in that, in that context, I would say that is when it became uh, we were aware. But I am not familiar with as to whether we were aware prior to, sir. Another court filing, Watton stated that the Army apparently made a policy determination that having its contractors pay for safe passage and money is cheaper than paying for that same passage in guns, bullets, and bodies. The court filing goes on to call extortion payments the realities of Afghan society and the realities of this war. Do you agree, General Towson, that simply it is just a cost of fighting war in Afghanistan? I'm not sure I'd agree that uh, it's the cost of fighting war in Afghanistan. It's certainly part of the landscape in Afghanistan. Um, and we took extraordinary efforts down even at the very low tactical level every day to try to root out when we would hear a report that uh, a checkpoint was charging 
passage fee, a toll, uh, we would go investigate that and go to great lengths to try to find out if they were charging a toll and how ways we could mitigate that. There, for one example, is we actually posted billboards beside some of these checkpoints that said you don't have, there's no toll required to pass to this checkpoint. Uh, then you have to deal with the Afghan literacy rate below 30 percent, and you and the have fact to that somebody with a gun is standing there asking for a toll. Some guy with a gun is standing there. You know, th there's no argument from us that uh, the corruption is probably the biggest victims. I think are the Afghan people, even so, more so than the American taxpayers. So the International Cri Crisis Group wrote, I think, saliently. Uh, the, there's a nexus between criminal enterprises, insurgent uh, networks, and corrupt political practices in Afghanistan. Uh, we know that there are a pile of relatives of people in high political offices uh, that are involved in these contracts or subcontractors and making these payments or whatever. So my question is, in order to break that nexus, what prosecutions have happened? How many people have been prosecuted? How high up the chain? Is, is the Afghan people, can they see an example of some of these well-connected people uh, actually ha being brought to, uh, to the rule of law, or are they going to continue to be an impediment to our insurgency, counterinsurgency, because they think the whole game is rigged and the government is as bad as the Taliban? I can answer that question not in the context of what we are talking about here, uh, trucking, you know, corruption. Right. But it's just I indicative. All that is just indicative of a much larger picture, so I am yeah, happy yeah, to have you yes, broaden it out. Um, uh, Kabul Bank, for example. Uh, there are a number of officials that are under investigation with respect to the Kabul Bank uh, situation, corruption practice there, uh, incident there. And I, th I think that we are hopeful that uh, the Afghan government will prosecute some of those uh, parties, but it is yet to happen. But there are a number of investigations, uh, over 20 investigations in work yeah. with Kabul Bank, and we are waiting to see what they do. And we are right now, the United States government is, uh, is uh, conditioning some of our uh, support to see the outcome of Kabul Bank. Well, I would hope so. I mean, you just drive from the airport uh, where you land your plane down to the Capitol and look up, and you can see houses up there that uh, are well-heeled people living in that, and the regular Afghan uh, people just really suffering and having a hard time making it, and they get it, too, uh, on that. I don't know how you ever get the confidence of them to support having this country come around and, um, and move in the right direction without doing more. Uh, in that regard. So I, I think you have got your work cut out for you. I think we ought to take a, a real hard look at our mission over there and, and the prospects for accomplishing uh, well-intended goals on this thing without really addressing that issue the way it ought to be. And I know it is political. And I know there are people like the intercession. I understand there are people into the Watan case and the Rahotula case with the Papal brothers or whatever. That is a good example of why people would be disgusted uh, when somebody should have been debarred and should have been out there that all of a sudden they get a slap on the wrist and are off and running. This is not good. Uh, not good, and I think we have to be cautious of that. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Un uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Under the host nation trucking, uh, the, we had eight prime contractors. Six of those eight were found to have committed in some sort of fraudulent behavior, uh, be fraudulent paperwork, uh, reverse money laundering, excessive profiteering, aiding and abetting, unjust enrichment. So now that the plan is, oh, instead of having just eight prime contractors, now we are going to go to 20 contractors. I mean, one of the criticisms of the host nation trucking uh, process was that we had too many subcontractors we couldn't keep track of, and that sometimes people were paying themselves only to pay themselves again and again and again. So how, what are you doing to alleviate this problem? Because you are expanding the number of contractors. And at the same time, what are you doing to make sure that those nefarious characters are not indeed just getting in line, but somewhere else under a different name? Sir, if I, if I could take that question. I think, uh, as I indicated earlier, the, the real approach is ensuring that we have the right oversight. Uh, it is true that, that the, uh, the number of prime contractors has expanded. Uh, in the new contract, it is 20 contractors, and many of those uh, prime contractors came from the previous contract. I can tell you that... How many? <laughs> I believe it is 11, 11 total, play either in a prime or subcontractor capacity, sir. That were have, and how many of those were have previously found to be involved none, in? None of those were found to be, be involved in this. They are just uh, 11 contractors that we know, they were subcontractors before that we know that they were, they conducted performance on the contract previously. But none now, of them Now, were my, my understanding project. is in order to be considered as a prime contractor, you have to have access to 600 trucks. Is that right? I believe it is 600 trucks. Uh, 
it, it may be across the suites. I'd have to take that, that for the record. I would tell you that uh, when uh, we what is the uh, in Afghanistan? I, I have to believe that the universe of potential vendors here, or potential contractors, is fairly small. I have some information on the uh, contracts. Um, I would tell you that it is a it is a growing industry. But when it when we went out with the contract, yeah, we're pouring two billion dollars in there. Of course, what percentage of the GDP? It's a growing industry. All right, it's probably the most enriched industry there is, next to the poppies. But go ahead. But um, but but basically, uh, when we went out uh, with the uh, with the contract, we asked contractors to come in the prime contract contractors and subcontractors to come in and identify what their capacity was in the contract. And I would tell you that there was sufficient sufficient. Uh, trucking assets to be provided within Afghanistan from the Afghan firms. So it is a developing industry. I would actually consider it a positive that we were able to grow the industry under the new contract and show some success. These new companies or, or these companies now participating in the new contract uh, have been vetted. Um, and so we we've So what what are you here to assure us that nobody who has been found to be fraudulent in the past is involved in this new contract? No, sir. No, sir. I'm not here to say that. I'm here to say that. Well, how do we get the assurance that that's the case? Well, I would tell you that there are risks associated with this and that the assurance that you have is that we are putting the oversight. Are they or are they not allowed to participate in this new contract if they're under suspension or have been found to be fraudulent in the previous contract? If they are under suspension, they are prohibited from receiving a contract award. That is correct. Um, but if there are ongoing investigations, um, we, you have to let the due process run. But right now, so I, I'm not here to tell you that something couldn't happen in the future, but those companies that we made awards to were not excluded and were not suspended, sir. I'd like to continue to, to dive further into that. Let, let, let me real quickly, I mean, time's short, we're going to have to come up for votes here again. Under the, the there's, there's two programs, the Afghan First and the Direct Assist is something that the State Department is very... Uh, adamant about pursuing. It, it, with those two programs, how is there an overlap of contrast here that we think will become increasingly? Look, we're asking for more oversight. We're asking for more accountability. And yet, at the same time, you got the State Department saying, you got to speed up the payments. You got to make these payments direct. Or direct. You got to make sure that. And I see a conflict between those objectives under Afghan First and Direct Assist as opposed to what we're trying to do. In making sure that the uh, two plus billion dollars is uh, is accountable, yes, Mr. Brunson. Sir, so, uh, that that segues into something I should have talked about earlier, and that is the two pending pieces in the NDAA legislation are somewhat key to uh, to address your concerns. The fact that uh, I can't remember whether it's the House or Senate version, but hopefully both pieces pass in committee, you have you will presumably give us the authority to delve deeper into those secondary, those tertiary contractors that we've never had before. Heretofore, as you know, we only have a legal relationship with the prime. If the law changes as, as, as is in the NDA, we will have, be able to go deeper. That's number one. Number two, you are going to grant, if the law passes, the commander on the ground greater authority to, to take people off the table uh, with, with, frankly, less legal proof that they are undeserving to continue or to be to operate with us, that we can actually use in our judgment process intel and a variety of other methods to, to make that assessment. Both of those pieces, we talked about that, the early testimony. Uh, we promised that we would bring you, you know, proposed legislation, and as always, it gets a little morphed as it gets on the Hill. But fundamentally, those piece, two pieces are in the NDAA, and they are somewhat key to, for, for Mr. Denver, to be able to dig further into those, those secondary and tertiary contracts. The reality is the trucking industry is a decentralized process, and the bulk of your, bulk of your truckers are owner-operators, just like they are in the United States, and that is not going to fundamentally change. So this, these guys that get these contracts are able to, to pull together uh, 600 or 450 sub, subs and they own 150. That's how they pull together their resources to make this happen. That's the reality of the business. It is the same way in the United States. The, 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 the key is, as is, is Mr. Denver has said, we are trying to vet that guy before he ever gets a chance to come to the table and not after the fact. Your 
legislation gives us greater ability to do that. You telling you for a second? Yes. Just on that point, I am looking through the report. As early as the summer of 2009, there were frequent reports of subcontractors and middlemen were paying contract money to, to warlords and the Taliban to guarantee safe passage for the convoys. U.S. Army investigators prepared a briefing for senior commanders that bore the blunt title, Host Nation Trucking Payments to Insurgents. The investigators estimated that the going rate for protection was $1,500 to $2,500 per truck paid by contractors and their subs to private Afghan security companies allied with warlords or insurgents, or in some cases directly to militias or Taliban commanders. That is a military report. The military maintained that the Federal contracting rules did not require and by some interpretations prohibited a close look below the level of prime contractors. I mean, that is a disgrace that somebody, would, somebody in the Department of Defense would have let out a contract that didn't let people to go deeper into uh, what was behind those uh, contracts at the subcontract level. But the better quote was from somebody in the military who said, these people should be fired and sent home. The senior defense officials said of the military overseers, that attitude is crazy. What are they saying? It is okay to pay the enemy because they have better snacks if the conv convoys travel uh, unimpeded? I think everybody gets that now. I hope everybody gets that now. I mean, that's, that kind of contracting is, is before first grade of uh, first level of law school. Thank you. Well, we are now going to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, gentlemen, the uh, Commission on Wartime Contracting, uh, which is an independent bipartisan commission, recently published a report summarizing their work in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, since uh, 2008. And uh, based on their estimates, in the last decade, the United States has spent more than $192 billion on contingency uh, contracts and grants. Of this amount, as much as $60 billion has been lost to contract waste and fraud. Uh, Mr. Mozak, do you think that is a, a, a reasonable estimate? Uh, sir, I think I hold the record for testifying in front of the Commission. So okay. uh, the, the answer is, based on the way we are discussing fraud, the answer is no. Because yes, no. no. What do you think is a better number? The, uh, the, I can't give you an exact number, but what okay, I have to do. I don't want to use your, but what you. I have to, what I would have to no, do. No, I just had one question and you answered it. Yes. So that's good. We need to move on. Okay. We are short on time. I am sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful. You have been very helpful as a witness. But uh, here is my, my issue. Right now, uh, the President has got a couple of plans one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, where we are going to reduce our profile for the military and we are going to actually use more and more contractors. And so we have got this problem. We have got, uh, at times, we have had more folks under contract uh, than we have had in the military. So as, that, as this trend continues, we'll be go the, they have estimated that we are already over-reliant on, on contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it is going to get more so as, as we draw our troops down. And so uh, they put it this way, uh, we're gonna, the United States will lose much of our mission essential organic capability. And, and, and also it will uh, create an Afghanistan rife with inflation and distorted economic activities. You've got some bad incentives in there. Uh, how, how do we, how do we uh, facilitate this transition with greater use of contractors? Eighty percent of these contractors are non-U.S. citizens, so we've got, we've got very little control over, over that, uh, you know, Accountability, I guess, is, is what I'm looking for. And with 80 percent of those uh, who are under contract non-U.S. citizens, I'm very concerned about uh, you know this corruption, um, you know, undermining the remaining effort that we're making in a, in Iraq and in Afghanistan uh, to stabilize both those countries. Where where does that leave us? Where does that leave us if we're transitioning to a contractor-based? Or, or contractor centric operation. Sir, sir, I mean, we don't have the capabilities in the organic force today in many of the areas yeah. that we are discussing. You would have to grow the Department of Defense to make that happen. So that is the reality. So you are absolutely correct. The, 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 the fact we have already talked about the broad issues and, and what needs to be done. A microcosm, in my mind, to eliminate and to give confidence to the local national. Are, is twofold. Number one, uh, with regards to the host nation trucking, as an example, we're not going to pay in dollars anymore. We're not going to pay in dollars. That that is a, a blinding flash of the obvious. We pay in Afghanis. 
So now it's not a question of dollars leaving the country, which, is, which has been a, a, a problem to begin with. Yeah. The second piece, and I don't know how to resolve this in the short term and long term, but until you can have a short payment to the individual without payoffs on the way down. We have this right. problem right. with the police, with the police. We have it endemic in the in the in the government. Right. Until you can pay the person directly their money, there is no confidence in the system. We have gone and through the international community, we are paying some of the police, I they realize not contractors, we're paying them on their cell phone because it goes directly to the, to the policeman and right. it doesn't filter down and lose those dollars along the way. So there are practical steps that you have to take, but you're absolutely correct. It will be a contractor-centric uh, institution. Iraq, obviously, uh, after December 31st, as things stand, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Chairman, my, my time has just about expired. I do want to say one thing, though. Having spent enough time over there in Afghanistan, the worst, as bad as this situation is, it would be worse if we had U.S. personnel, military personnel, uh, you know, providing security on these convoys. It would just be the body count would be, uh, you know, just totally unacceptable. So I, I appreciate the effort that you've made uh, to, to straighten this mess out. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'm going to recognize uh, uh, Ranking Member Tierney for just a moment here as, uh, as we conclude. We have votes coming up on the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. I just have a couple. Rahula continues to be uh, providing security on the road in Afghanistan to this day. If, uh, anybody look at the intelligence reports in our intelligence community about the background of this individual? You don't know. All right. Sir, I'd, I'd like to say this about Rahula. Can't go into it a whole lot, but who is not off our scope? The I would like, if you gentlemen would, uh, provide for us at some point in time in written form uh, subsequent to this hearing uh, the, the amount of uh, prosecutions that are uh, ongoing right now for, for this type of corruption and graft, as well as the amounts of money that have been recovered to date. Uh, and lastly, I just want to sort of get an idea of who is responsible so that we when we look at this and try to evaluate later on, we can, we can know who to call for witnesses and who to talk to. As I understand it, the, the trucking contracts now uh, for oversight, it's the 419th uh, Mount Control Battalion uh, that are in charge of management of the contract. Is that correct? Nobody here knows. All right. That's one problem. Uh, they report that 143rd Expeditionary Sustainment Brigade. Does that sound reasonable? Sir, today, but they'll transition perhaps even before you, you have your next hearing. That's going to change again. It, it will change, you know, as as units rotate. I would I would caution about using use the we'll we'll find the organizations for you and give you the hierarchy. I think that's what you're looking for. Uh, well, it is because what I have from the investigations that we did was that the contract signing uh, is uh, the immediate responsibility of the uh, the Bagram Contracting Center, Regional Contracting Center who reports to the principal assistant responsible for contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, who gets authority from the Army Acquisition Executive and the Secretary of the Army, uh, but in practical matter from CENTCOM. So where do you gentlemen fit in in that chain? The, uh, the commander of JTC, JTSCC. Can you, rather than using acronyms, yeah. can you? Yeah, the commander of Joint, tri, joint uh, Support Contracting Command is Admiral Kalathis. He is my deputy. And he is detailed there for a year to uh, to 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 so, operate that. So is he doing the regional contracting center in Bagram? He he owns that. Okay. He owns that. And you work for him? Uh, he no. He works for me. He works for you. Normally, I've okay. he's been detailed forward. If if I could very quickly explain it, the army is the executive agent for contracting in the conflict. We had to give the executive agency to someone. And it, it, could have been, it could have been a service, it could have been an agency. The Army is the executive agent. They have tried many years to get away from that. They are going to stay the executive agent. And because of that, the Army Acquisition Executive, who is Mr. Denver's boss, is the ultimate responsible uh, agent from the contracting standpoint. So the authority and the warrants for the people to operate under the Joint, uh, joint Contracting Command come via the Army to spend money and so appeals and oversight, direct oversight of contracts, it, with very few exceptions within Afghanistan, are the Army's responsibility. 
Sir, if we'll, I will we'll, 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 I'll give you the wiring diagram, sir. If I may take a moment to add to that. So that is true. The, uh, the OSD appointed the Army as the executive agent. That executive agency went to my boss. I am actually uh, de detailed those uh, authorities for executive agency, and I have an organization that provides broad oversight. When you get into theater, uh, Reverend Admiral Calathis is the head of the contracting activity in theater, and then he has two senior contracting officials that work for him one for a senior contracting official Afghanistan, one for a senior contracting official Iraq. The senior contracting official Afghanistan oversees those regional contracting offices, the one that, that you referred to. And, but that is the contracting chain of command flow of authority, sir. Well, then I suspect we will be seeing you gentlemen back here again, uh, since you have responsibility. And I, I want to thank the Chairman again for, uh, for working with us on this and appreciate his hard work and leadership on this matter. Thank you all for testifying. I, I want to thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your uh, commitment uh, to our country, for your service. Um, we, we do thank you. Uh, the, the, the Pentagon, uh, the Department of Defense has to get this right. The State Department has to get this right. We are talking about billions upon billions upon billions of dollars that, unfortunately, we know is going to fuel some of the very people that we are trying to suppress. That is totally unacceptable. The waste, fraud, and abuse that is happening in the theater of war is unacceptably high, and we see that in report after report. I understand the difficulties, um, and I am trying to appreciate all the nuances in the difficulty of war. And there will be some small degree uh, that, that, that happens in that theater. But when we hear about tens of billions of dollars in waste, fraud, and abuse, it is unacceptable. One of the next hearings that we will have uh, in, in, this in this subcommittee will deal with what is happening in Iraq, because we have to get the contracting uh, part of the equation right. Is the transitions made from the Department of Defense to the State Department? State Department is looking to, to uh, bring up uh, something like 17,000 contractors. So the news clips may be that we are drawing down in Iraq, but the reality is we are hiring up in Iraq to the tune of 17,000 contractors in an unbelievable amount of money. We have to get this equation right. I thank you all for being here. I appreciate the great work uh, from Mr. Tierney and his staff uh, in very collaborative effort. You are going to find uh, Republicans and Democrats very united working together on this. Uh, so at this time, this committee will stand adjourned.